So in this episode of Brain Ponderings, it's my pleasure to talk with Professor Ted Dawson of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He's a neurologist and neuroscientist. He's also um, director of the STEM, uh, it's actually called the Institute for Cell Engineering at Johns Hopkins. It focuses a lot on stem cells and a lot of the modern technologies for essentially making any cell type in the body or brain from stem cells and then trying to understand them, use them for modeling disease and even for developing treatments. So Ted, um, why don't you talk about your background? You have both a, you're both, both a physician and a, a neuroscientist and you did your early training at uh, University of Utah Medical Center, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I um, Well, I went to um, undergrad in Montana State University in Bozeman, and then I um, went to medical school at the University of Utah, got an MD, PhD there in pharmacology, and then um, did an internship in internal medicine there in, at the University of Utah and then went on and did a neurology residency at the University of Penn in Philadelphia. Then came to Johns Hopkins in um, 1990, where I did a fellowship in neuroscience with Saul Snyder, who then was chair of the Department of Neuroscience, and then also did a, a movement disorder fellowship here at Hopkins and then was, um, I guess, got on the faculty and I think 93 and then have been here ever since. And your, your PhD work at Utah, that was, that's where you got interested in Parkinson's, I gather. You were looking at essentially mapping where dopamine receptors and uh, are are located in the brain, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that that's probably where um, things started. I um, worked with um, Jim Wamsley, who was a new professor at University of Utah in the Department of Psychiatry. He trained with Michael Kuhar here at Hopkins where, you know, receptor audiography was developed. And then we, I guess during my um, graduate work, we mapped the distribution of both D1 and D2 receptors in the mouse and started to do a bit in the human brain. And that, that's probably what piqued my interest, at least in dopamine, and um, got me interested in Parkinson's disease. Probably um, when I was a resident, in um, neurology is where my interests in move, movement disorders and particularly par Parkinson's disease was really solidified. Um, there were a couple of clinicians at Penn, um, Howard Hurtig and Matt Stern, who I had some affinity for and spent, spent a lot of extra time in their clinic gain, gaining a special interest in movement disorders and Parkinson's disease. And, and that, that's probably where things were really set in motion. Now, when you, when you see, see a patient coming to the clinic with having some problems in controlling their body movements, how do you, how do you diagnose Parkinson's disease? Well, you know, pa patients will um, present with um, either um, classically either, either a couple of signs. One is their, their families noted that they've slowed down, that they're a little stiff, or they'll present with a tremor that tends to be at rest. Um, and, um, and, and often those patients will see their internist or family doctor first. Um, but, 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 but eventually they make their way to uh, 
neurologist or movement disorder expert. And um, as I mentioned, they, all, they, they have a rest tremor. It tends to occur when they're completely at rest. It's a low frequency tremor. And then patients also have slowness of movement and a movement disorder neurologist assess it by looking at how fast they're able to tap their index finger against their thumb, how fast they're able to open and close their fist. Also, when they walk, their um, gait can be slow. They often have a decreased arm swing. Hmm. Um, and then the other thing is they um, will develop um, problems with balance that you can assess by what's called a pull test. So you give a patient a brisk pull back and most patients will be able to step back and catch themselves. Whereas a patient with Parkinson's disease will um, stumble. Hmm. Um, and, and, and so when you do the pull test, you need to be prepared to um, catch the patient. Huh. Um, and, um, and, and those are the usual way in which the um, illness is diagnosed. And, and then, you know, usually during the initial stages of the illness, you can just manage it with physical therapy, um, modification of diet, but, but, but eventually patients will need med medication. And the, now the medication that's commonly used to treat patients with Parkinson's, it can improve their symptoms, but my understanding is it's not stopping or preventing the, the degeneration of the dopamine pr producing neurons, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So, um, you know, an, an, an initially we um, might start patients on MAOP inhibitors like selegiline or risagiline that provides some symptomatic benefit. There's also some suggestion it might slow the progression, but the, the data on that is not solid. And then um, the next treatment might be a dopamine agonist, um, such as reprenorol or pramipexol. There's others, but it's now become clear that patients that go on dopamine agonists can um, get um, a dopamine agonist induced disorder of of um, you know excessive eating, um, you know inappropriate behavior where they might excessively spend, um, sexually inappropriate behavior. So it the 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 use of those agents is somewhat waned, and and then the other mainstay of therapy is Cinemet, which is a combination of levodopa and carbidopa. And, and, and that provides relatively good symptomatic therapy for probably the first three to five years of the patient's diagnosis, and then they start to develop side effects. But, 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 but you're right, there's, there's nothing that's been proven to slow the progression or um, prevent the illness from getting worse. And the, the vast majority of people with Parkinson's develop the symptoms when they get older, maybe in their 70s or even 80s. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of variability between people in, in the kind of the, the time course of progression of the disease. I mean, I had an uncle um, who he was diagnosed in early 80s and he progressed pretty rapidly. I think he lived only about six years after that. But then I also know of other people who, well, Michael J. Fox, I guess is a really good example. Uh, 
that have for decades, they've lived uh, many decades actually with Parkinson's disease. Is that right? There's a lot of variability? Yeah, there's a lot of um, variability in the um, course of the illness. You know, there's the, the Michael J. Fox, you know, it's uh, been funding this, what they call the Parkinson's disease progression marker initiative. And it's probably the largest, most extensive longitudinal study in Parkinson's disease. And, you know, it's, it's, it, its goal is to try to identify biomarkers and understand the disease a bit better. And from that, if you look at the data, there's probably about 20% of patients that are fall into this category where they're slow progressors. And, and clinicians had known this for quite some time, but, 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 but this is, you know, really quantitative documentation of it. And, and then there's another subgroup of patients which rapidly progress. And then there's other patients that are in between. If you combine them all, you get this average, you know, of, you know, from diagnosis patients, you know, progress over, you know, three to eight years. They then develop side effects from the medication. And then about from eight to 15 to 20 years, there's, you know, you need to treat the side effects of the medication. And then in the last 15, 20 years, patients start to become cognitively impaired. But, 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 but within that, there are patients that, you know, that, that could extend out much beyond the 20 years or like your, I, I believe you said your uncle. Yeah you know, where, where they rapidly progress over, over a course of three to six years. How you um, identify those patients when they're initially diagnosed is still um, a, a mystery. And it's, and it's not clear why some people progress more rapidly than others, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, now, and Parkinson's disease uh, genetics has really been extremely valuable in understanding what's going wrong in, in neurons in the brain. Uh, can you talk kind of the, uh, historically on the first gene identified in which mutations cause early onset Parkinson's and then some of the other mutations and I guess we can spend some time on this because this is what a lot of your main work is getting at these mechanisms having to do with the mitochondria and cell, cell garbage disposal and so on. So I, I guess just take some time and go through the, the historically on the genetics and then the cell biology of what we now think is going wrong. Yeah, I, I, I should say that when I was a um, medical student, you know, and, and I, I think a lot of medical, you know, pe people that are my generation remember being taught in um, medical school that um, Parkinson's disease was a disorder that wasn't genetic. Mm. I, I, I think you know, movement disorder specialists back then knew probably that it was genetic because they saw clusters of families. Um, and, and there were some twin studies that also suggested that it wasn't genetic, but, but it wasn't until a um, group um, that was led by, um, actually the Clinician was Roger Duasan. The um, geneticist was Michael Polymeropoulos with Robert Nussbaum at the um, NIH, who um, provided the first definitive evidence that there was a gene that caused um, Parkinson's disease. And they determined that it was alpha synuclein 
And one of the first mutations that was identified was an alanine to threonine mutation at position 53 in the alpha synuclein gene. And then um, shortly after that, um, um, John Trojanowski and um, Dr. Spillantini um, in collaboration showed that um, alpha synuclein was enriched in Lewy bodies, which is the pathologic hallmark of um, Parkinson's disease. And, and, and that really set in motion the search for other genes that cause um, Parkinson's disease. And, and there's now a whole host of them. Um, alpha, alpha, mu, mu, mutations in alpha synuclein, I think there are half a dozen point mutations in the gene that um, cause autosomal dominant, early onset Parkinson's disease. There's also um, simple duplication or triplication of the gene can cause um, Parkinson's disease. So, so this is the normal protein, just increasing the levels by duplication or triplication can cause early onset Parkinson's disease. And um, it causes autosomal dominant. There are other genes that cause autosomal dominant Parkinson's disease. Probably the most common one is a mutation in the gene called leucine rich repeat kinase 2, LERC2 or LARC2, depending on which camp you're in. Um, and it's a kinase and mutations in the um, LARC2 increase the kinase activity. Um, there's also um, a number of autosomal recessive genes Parkin, which is a ubiquitin E3 ligase. Pink one, which is another kinase. And Parkin and pink one have been shown to regulate mitochondrial quality control, all aspects of it from degradation of mitochondria, which is called mitophagy, to regulation of biogenesis and also transport of mitochondria and fission and fusion of mitochondria. There's another gene called DJ1, which um, is a multifunctional protein. It um, seems to be involved in um, detoxifying um, free radicals and in a particular hydrogen peroxide, there are- um, well, that's, it. that's probably in the mitochondria. Yeah, yes, yeah. So everything seems, all these genetic mutations seem to converge on a mechanism that involves some abnormality in the function or removal or production of new mitochondria. Yeah, even- even alpha synuclein, you know, there's a lot of work that says it causes um, dysfunction of the mitochondria. Yeah. There's there's been work that LRKK2 LARC2 can also affect mitochondrial function. There there there's probably, you know, I I I would say in 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 addition to mitochondrial dysfunction, there's um, defects in proteostasis protein synthesis, probably synaptic dysfunction probably also is, um, is pr probably a, a, a common player in it as well. Now you mentioned that with that alpha synuclein mutations, uh, it's early onset disease. What, what age does people that have these mutations start to become symptomatic? Well, you know, the um, autosomal recessive genes like Parkin and Pink can be as early as the 20s or 30s. Uh, 
there, 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 there's even been some um, juvenile onset of Parkinson's disease. Al Alvacinuclein probably in the 40s and 50s would be the majority of those patients. Um, mu mutations in LARC2 can span from the 50s all the way up to the 80s. And, and, and the, the, the one thing about LARC2 is there's this variable penetrance. And so there's probably some associated genetic factor that determines the age of onset for patients that have mutations in LRKK2. Yeah. So I guess there's a certain age range of onset where those families, the uh, Yeah, I think, uh, I guess we can talk about this now a little bit, um, because in these families, there is the potential to, in theory, eliminate the disease from the, from the families by uh, DNA sequencing. So, you know, seeing if, a, say, a teenager has a mutation and then genetic counseling, they could be informed that, you know, if you have, say the dominant mutations in particular, if you have the mutation, there's a 50% chance of your child having it. And, you know, they may use that information to make decisions on, do they wanna have a child? Do they wanna adopt? There's even ways now you can do, um, um, in it's called in vitro fertilization and embryo selection, where they, where you can actually know uh, whether, I, I guess you can actually ensure that the child won't have the mutation, even though you have it. What are your thoughts on that? It's, it's, it's you get in some ethical things here, but it it is interesting that in theory it's possible to eliminate these dominantly inherited disease in particular. Yeah, you know, um, I, we're getting into the, um, I guess, moral and ethical issues of medicine, but, 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 but certainly the technology exists where one could do embryo selection, um, you know, um, which for families that carry, you know, mutations which are uniformly lethal, you know, that at least in my mind would be a reasonable thing to do. Other folks would deal with that, um, yeah, would that, just, just, just disagree. You know, in, in, in Parkinson's disease, though, it's a little different because these aren't diseases that are lethal. They um, just dramatically affect your quality of life um, during, you know, in, in your 50s and 60s. And and so I I I, I think that would become yeah. I, I think a personal and sure choice that 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 a family would need to make, but but it's definitely an option yeah. that that I I think um, particularly as genome sequencing becomes more prevalent and cheaper, you know, young. Um, parents are going to have that as an option where they can make that choice. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the genetics tends to hone in on problems with mitochondria and 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 removing uh, abnormal proteins like I guess alpha synuclein, as you mentioned it accumulates in high amounts in these 
inside of the dopamine producing neurons. Um, and actually that's kind of in a way similar to Alzheimer's where you get this protein tau abnormally accumulating. Uh, can you, there was this really interesting um, story that of a neurologist called Bill Langston who discovered a chemical that causes essentially Parkinson's disease in, in terms of the clinical presentation. Can you talk, it's a very fascinating story. And that also, Bill Langston's work and those that worked with him pointed to the mitochondrial problems being a, a big issue. Yeah, there was, um... You know, this was um, in Northern California at, at the time, Bill, Bill Langston, I think, was an assistant professor at Stanford. And there were a group of uh, patients who presented to the ER with um, Parkinson's disease. They were in their 30s. Um, there was about 30 or 40 of them. And... Um, through Bill's um, detective work, they determined that, um, well, one, the, the majority of these patients were all um, IV drug users and their dealer was um, synthesizing derivatives of Demerol, which is an opiate-like compound um, because at the time the the federal laws um, you you could go to jail for selling heroin or um, demerol but the derivatives of those compounds weren't on the list huh. so the drug dealer reason well if I can make a derivative of this then I could sell it and not go to jail and unbeknownst to him, he was synthesizing a compound that was determined to be MPTP, which causes acute Parkinson's disease in humans, non-human primates, and rodents. Also, um, at the same time, Sandoz Pharmaceutical was synthesizing derivatives of Demerol and one of their chemists developed um, Parkinson's disease. And um, Erwin Copen at the NIH figured that out. And, and so it was actually the work of both Bill and Erwin who, who led to, to the discovery of MPTP. And, and then what followed was an enormous amount of work on trying to understand how MPTP causes Parkinson's disease. And it was determined that MPTP um, is metabolized to MPP plus. And Saul Snyder at Johns Hopkins showed that MPP plus was a substrate of the dopamine transporter. And so the MPP plus was concentrated in dopamine neurons. And then I'm not sure who showed that MPP plus was a mitochondrial complex one toxin, which then um, led to the death of dopamine neurons. And it really set in motion a number of investigators exploring the role of mitochondrial dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. And to this day, mitochondrial dysfunction, impairment, and complex one is still a major player in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease, yeah. which really stem from this initial discovery that MPTB caused Parkinson's disease and working out the molecular mechanisms of how it kills dopamine neurons. And this, um, this preceded the genetic you know, discovery of alpha synuclein mutations and so on. 
lurked. Oh yeah, by 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 at least a couple of decades. So yeah, so during those two decades, uh, administering MPTP to rodents or monkeys was a model on it, you know, animal models that could be used to try to identify treatments that protect the dopamine neurons. Uh, so there was oh. a, lot, a lot of work uh, in, in animal models. Yeah, absolutely. There were a number of studies, you know, um, working out the um, molecular mechanism of how MPTP kills cells. You know, it's metabolized to MPP plus. The enzyme that metabolizes it is monoamine oxidase. And so that led to clinical trials of monoamine oxidase B inhibitors, selegiline and resagiline in Parkinson's disease. And I'd mentioned earlier, there's some evidence that they may slow the progression. Um, there was also work that blocking um, glutamate receptors, particularly NMDA receptors, was protective in the MPTP model. That led to clinical trials of NMDA receptor antagonists in Parkinson's disease. Um, those um, didn't pan out, particularly because of the side effects yeah. of NMDA receptor antagonists in patients. And then there were a number of studies working out, you know, how does dysfunction of complex one in the mitochondria lead to, um, you know, death of dopamine neurons? And, and there's still clinical trials going on today, um, you know, in investigating a host of molecular mechanisms by which complex one um, kills dopamine neurons. And, and, and some of those now, some, some of those pathways intersect with the same pathways that um, alpha-synuclein kills dopamine neurons um, and um, some, some of the other genetic mutations. And also that and other work like epidemiological studies and suggest that, so there are certain pesticides, rotenone, for example, or paraquat, that uh, have a similar effects on the mitochondria, inhibiting this electron transport chain that pr normally produces the ATP. And what what's the current state of, uh, of data, I guess, on environmental exposures and risk for Parkinson's disease. Yeah, you you bring up um, paraquat, you know, paraquat, it, it's controversial, but, 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 but I would say the majority of evidence probably indicates that in animal models, paraquat can cause um, loss of um, dopamine neurons. Um, it is somewhat structurally similar to MPP+. Probably the more convincing data with Paraquat is when you combine it with MANIB. Um, you, I, I think most people would agree that it causes Parkinson-like symptoms in animal models. And one of the things um, that if you look epidemiologically, particularly in um, the California migrant workers, mm -hmm. um, the migrant workers who have been exposed to both Paraquat and MANIB have a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease. And one of the things that the chemical industry fails to acknowledge is they, they say that um, paraquat is never used in conjunction with MANIB. Mm -hmm. 
and manum is never used in conjunction with pear cloth. What they fail to mention is, yeah, that year pear cloth may not have been used with manum, but next year we use manum. And so uh -huh. there are all these plots of land where there's this rotating exposure to different toxins. Huh. And, and, and so there's, I think, fairly good evidence that, that, that those increase the risk of um, Parkinson's disease. There, there's recent work that um, also um, compounds which are um, chemicals that are used in some of these, um, um, oh, what do they call them? They're, they're, um, and they, they've, they've been designated toxic sites and, and people that have lived or bought houses in those areas also have an increased risk of Parkinson's disease. So there's multiple types of um, toxins that are in our environment which um, increase the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Hmm. Okay, let's get, let's get to your work, Ted, uh, your, your specific work. Uh, you've worked on Parkinson's disease over the many decades now, and your wife, Valina Dawson, uh, is a collaborator on some of the studies. But uh, I guess, could you take a few minutes and describe some of your own most, what you think are the most important discoveries that have advanced understanding of what's going wrong in uh, neurons and then how that information might be used to develop new approaches for drug development or, or even other approaches for treatment. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, all, all this work is, as you mentioned, been done, or a, a lot of it's been done collaboratively with uh, Valina. Probably, we, we, we could start with the MPTP model. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we, we showed that in the MPTP model that um, dopamine neurons die via formation of nitric oxide that's produced both by neuronal nitric oxide synthase and inducible nitric oxide synthase that um, leads to DNA damage, which activates this enzyme called poly-ADP ribose polymerase, which um, makes poly-ADP ribose which um, activates this um, death pathway that we name called parthanatose. And, and so the, the PAR, the byproduct of the poly P ribose polymerase, it's made in the nucleus. It leaves the nucleus, goes into the cytosol, binds to um, apoptosis inducing factor which is released from the mitochondria. And then it goes back to the nucleus and along the way picks up this protein called macrophage migration inhibitory factor called MIF, which we showed has nuclease activity. And then this MIF nuclease is the final executioner and, and we showed, and, and so this work started with the MPTP model, but, but we showed that it also plays a critical role in how alpha-synuclein kills dopamine neurons in that you can block pathologic alpha-synuclein toxicity by inhibition of PARP, by knockout of PARP, by um, knockout of MIF, by um, creating mice which don't have MIF nuclease activity, and by 
TARP inhibitors and by MIF nuclease inhibitors. I, I, I think that's some of our more important work. We, we've also been um, very interested in how Parkin and Pink regulate mitochondrial quality control. And we've, like others have shown that they regulate mitophagy, but what we think a more important part of the mitochondrial quality control is mitochondrial biogenesis. And we identified this protein, which we named Paris. It's also ZNF746. And in the absence of Parkin and Pink, it's upregulated where it inhibits this master regulator of mitochondria called PGC1 alpha. And that leads to um, inhibition of mitochondrial biogenesis. Hmm. And if you knock out Paris or inhibit its function, you can dramatically protect um, dopamine neurons from degeneration. So, uh, so in the first part of your findings, you described, you're, you essentially showed that there's, there's this ap process of apoptosis, or it's also called programmed cell death. It's a normally a natural process in a lot of our tissues where the cells turn over, like say our skin or the lining of our gut. Our cells are dying right now as we speak, undoubtedly cells in my gut. Some are dying and they die in a manner where they don't usually adversely affect their surrounding cells. Of course, neurons, neurons don't divide. They're, we call post mitotic. So um, they can't, they aren't normally replaced in most brain regions. And certainly I, I'm not aware of any evidence that the dopaminergic neurons are replaced. So your findings suggest that uh, that activation of this pathway that involves mitochondria and then these enzymes going to the nucleus and chewing up the DNA and then the cell dying is um, kind of activating these pathways that are at least in part normal for cell death in other cells, but they're being activated in neurons where they shouldn't be activated. Is, is that right or is that too much of a leap. Yeah, well, you're, you know, um, yes, there are um, cell death pathways that are involved in, you know, development. You know, you need to, you know, remove cells during development. And, and and then like in the, the gut, which has a constant turnover and the skin, you know, you need to replace those cells. And so part of the way they're replaced is through, you know, regulated program cell death pathways. Yeah. And in, in the nervous system, you know, which, you know, there, there, there are some areas where neurons turn over, but the majority don't. But, but those pathways of cell death are lying dormant in those cells. And during neurodegenerative diseases, those um, pathways become reactivated. Yeah. And, and there's a whole host of these regulated cell death pathways. And, and one of them is a pathway which we call parthenatos, which we think plays a, a, a really important role in Parkinson's disease. What's th Thanatos is a Greek word? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's, he's, he's the um, Greek god of death. Um, <laughs> okay. The Grim yeah. Reaper. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's the Grim Reaper in Greek mythology. <laughs> uh, now, what about the, 
so in your animal models, these the inhibitors of this pathway, the the PAR PARP inhibitors. What about clinical trials? Have, are they going to be tried in patients? Well, we've been um, trying to um, advance one of the PARP inhibitors into patients. What there, there's a couple of issues which are um, slowing things down. One is all, all the PARP inhibitors that have been developed have been developed for cancer. And, um, and the PARP inhibitors do two things. One is they inhibit PARP, but they also trap PARP on DNA. And this interferes with um, homologous recombination mediated DNA repair. Oh. And that's how they're effective as cancer chemotherapeutics. Mm. And there's some, and probably rightfully so, do we want to give patients with a chronic neurodegenerative disease agents which can infect DNA repair. Yeah. And, but, but there is one inhibitor, um, Vilaparib, which is a poor DNA trapper, which we've been trying to convince the company that makes Vilaparib that it's worth studying in Parkinson's disease. And, and those negotiations are still in progress. And, and what about other targets that you've identified? Are there, are you, you have efforts uh, for drug development and some of the other? Yeah, so, so we recently, um, well, in, in the last month or so, we published a paper in Cell where we described a MIF nuclease inhibitor. And so we're working with a biotech company that we helped help co-found neurally to um, develop MIF nuclease inhibitors. You know, as, as you know, that's a slow process. You've got to identify an inhibitor that's, you know, not metabolized, that gets into the brain, yeah. has a good half-life, not toxic. And, and so those studies are ongoing. And we're, we're also trying to develop Paris inhibitors. Okay. Um, so MIF, you've also done, worked on some inflammation pathways. And is MIF involved in inflammation? Um, well, you know, MIF, MIF is a, it's, it's another one of these multifunction proteins like DJ1. Yeah. And, and MIF, MIF was discovered Oh, probably 50 years ago. It's an atypical cytokine. Right. And there is work, not our work, but other work, which suggests that it's involved in inflammation. And, and so we're trying to see whether there's a connection between its nuclease activity and its inflammation activity. But 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 that work is ongoing. And that, that's something we haven't touched on. But this is a, a big area now in the field of neurodegenerative disorders that local inflammation going on that may be contributing to the degeneration of the neurons. In fact, you mentioned uh, nitric oxide, this gas, which actually it has normal functions in the brain. And I'm going to have a... Saul Snyder was a little uh, hesitant to do the podcast. He's I think he's kind of nervous about the format. So Bindu Paul, who's a did a lot of work with him, we're going to have a podcast on gasotransmitters, nitric oxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide gas. And it turns out, that, as you know, but our, our listeners may not, these gases are normally produced in your brain and the evidence is emerging. They're very important for brain functions like learning and memory, et cetera. But when the levels get too high and they're out of control, it causes problems. Um, so, okay. Yeah, no, I, 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 I look forward to that podcast. I, I, I should mention one thing. 
mark on this inflam inflammation. Yeah. There's a lot of work that um, has been done where work work by our lab and also other labs where where alpha synuclein um, toxicity um, that adaptive immunity plays a role that innate immunity the C gas sting pathway plays a role and um, and and we recently published a paper that the park and pink pathways also involved with activating the um, innate immunity. Yeah. And, and, and this is a real, I think, emerging area that your, your, your listeners should stay tuned for. Yeah. Maybe, maybe there'll be another podcast on that. Yeah. Uh, I've been kind of lately, I've been, uh, kind of thinking back to the 1970s when I was, uh, yeah, early 1970s when I was in high school and well, I guess late 60s, early 70s. And my father and I and brother used to listen to uh, to um, boxing matches on, on the radio. You know, and of course, Muhammad Ali was one of my favorites says with a lot of people, right? And so a few weeks ago, I was watching Muhammad Ali's fight with George Foreman, where Ali was in a, in a sense an underdog because Foreman had been just like demolishing everybody he fought. And, and Ali in that fight, you know, so Muhammad Ali had Parkinson like symptoms, right? And I don't think they did an autopsy, but probably had dopamine neuron loss. And so the conventional thinking is, you know, his Parkinson's may be a result of repeated head trauma. But when I was watching this fight with Foreman, it was Muhammad Ali's gut, his, you know, midsection that was really being hit hard by Foreman. And of course, Ali had a tough body in that area and could take it. So can you talk about this, this fascinating uh, evidence that Parkinson's may actually begin in the gut and perhaps in Muhammad Ali, it began in the gut. We'll never know, but maybe, you know. Yeah, there's, um, there was these, Interesting um, observations by Heiko Brock in Germany, who conducted um, autopsies on patients, full body autopsies, and stained the, um, the gut, the brain stem, and, and the brain for alpha synuclein, which is, you know, one, one of the pathologic features of Parkinson's disease. And what he found was, if you had alpha synuclein up in your cortex, you had it in your midbrain brain stem and all the way down to the gut. And then he found some patients who just had it in the brain stem, but patients who had it in the brain stem always had it down lower. And so he proposed this hypothesis that the alpha synuclein aggregates started down in the gut and ascended up the vagal nerve. He, he modified his hypothesis later because people reminded him that there's also people have defects in smell. And, and so there's both the gut and maybe the nose. Uh. And, um, but, but, but that prompted a lot of scientists to start looking at the gut. And so probably one of the first studies that um, provided some evidence for this was out of um, Sarkis Mazanian's lab at Caltech, where they took alpha synuclein transgenic mice 
they put them on a um, germ-free diet. Um, and, and, you know, essentially kill their bacteria. And, and those mice, their Parkinson's or their synuclinopathy occurred later in life. And then he took those same germ-free mice, gave them bacteria from humans who did not have Parkinson's disease versus humans who had Parkinson's disease. And the mice that got Parkinson's disease bacteria had, um, had accelerated the synuclinopathy in the mice. And, and then our lab came into it and said, well, if Heiko Brock's hypothesis is right, we should be able to model that in mice. So, um, in collaboration with Hansa Ko and Jay Preshrika here at Hopkins, we um, took the um, recombinant synuclein, aggregated it into fibrils, sonicated those fibrils, and then we injected it in an area of the stomach that's densely innervated by the vagal nerve. And we were able to get the exogenous synuclein to template endogenous synuclein to misfold and spread up the vagal nerve yeah. and cause Parkinson's disease. Hmm. Yeah. And we think that's really the first convincing experimental evidence that Heiko Brock's hypothesis was correct. Yeah. And there's also, um, there's this interesting study in Scandinavia. Some people actually have their vagus nerve cut, this nerve that comes from the brainstem to the gut um, for, I guess I don't know for sure, certain disorders. So they have the vagus nerve cut. And these investigators in Scandinavia found that people that have their vagus nerve cut are less likely to develop Parkinson's disease. Yeah, that's correct. There, there, there were two studies. Um, you know, um, back, um, you know, two or three decades ago, treatment of severe peptic ulcer disease. Oh, okay. You know, um, you would do a vagotomy. Hmm. And, and those are in patients who had life-threatening peptic ulcer disease because they get okay. GI bleeds from their peptic ulcer disease. And, and, and this was before H. pylori was discovered. You know, Zantac was discovered. Prevacid was discovered, things like that. Yeah. And, and so then they went back and looked at those patients and sure enough, patients who had vagotomy had a markedly decreased incidence of Parkinson's disease, which, which supports this um, hypothesis of Brock's. We, we did vagotomies in our mice and, and we also prevented Parkinson's yeah. disease in our mice. Yeah. Now you mentioned Sarkis Masmanian. I, I did a podcast with him actually. It's up on the YouTube channel and on Spotify and some of the other audio outlets. Um, and there's also, yeah, this fecal transplantation is kind of an interesting therapeutic approach. There is some evidence, for example, that with people with obesity may benefit from getting, essentially putting bacteria from a person with a healthy bacterial composition, gut composition, you know, do a fecal transplant. Do you know if there's any, anyone considering or planning uh, trials of fecal transplants, um, I guess you'd have to 
Of course, with any of these neurodegenerative disorders, by the time someone's diagnosed, there's lot, already a lot of damage. But you know, the idea would, I guess, get patients as early in the disease process as you can. And, and that, yeah, there's there there's been some discussion, but I don't know whether it's okay. gone further than discussing it. There, there's clearly different. Um, you know, microbiome, bacteria, flora in patients with Parkinson's disease versus those that don't have Parkinson's disease. And, and, and the question is, is it a chicken or egg thing? It, do, do they have different bacterial flora because they have Parkinson's disease or do they have Parkinson's disease because yeah. they have different bacterial flora? Yeah. So let's let's finish up by talking about what's going on with uh, potential ways to reduce one's risk for Parkinson's, I guess, on the one hand, and then treatments. So, what about exercise? Is, uh, I've seen some papers suggesting, you know, early. You mentioned physical therapy. Uh, if someone's diagnosed with Parkinson's. They may benefit in the early stages, but what about for risk reduction? Is there any evidence that people who exercise regularly are less likely to get Parkinson's? Yeah, there's um, some small studies that suggest that exercise is beneficial, and um, you know, vi vig vigorous exercise. And there's now a phase three clinical trial to um, that's ongoing to, to evaluate whether exercise is uh, beneficial. You know, and, and exercise, you know, there's been, you know, work by Bruce Spiegelman, which, you know, has identified, you know, these small peptides that are released from um, muscle during yeah. vigorous exercise. Yeah. And he's shown they're beneficial in models of Alzheimer's disease. And so there's actually probably a molecular basis for, for why exercise could be beneficial in Parkinson's disease. And uh, in the case of Alzheimer's, there's quite a bit of evidence now that people with longstanding obesity or particularly insulin resistance and diabetes are more prone to developing cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's. Are there, what's known about how one's, uh, I guess, metabolic health, you'd say, uh, insulin sensitivity and so on, does that affect somebody's risk for developing Parkinson's? Yeah, um, yeah, there's, there, there's evidence along the same lines, uh, Mark, in, um, Parkinson's disease. Um, I, I, I would say Parkinson's disease came a little later to the game than, than Alzheimer's disease, but, 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 but there's clearly some, some association as well. Okay, potentially another reason that for people to have a healthy body weight and, and exercise and eat a good diet. Now from energy metabolism standpoint, I've been involved in some collaborations. Uh, when I was at National Institute on Aging, um, they developed Josephine Egan and Nigel Gregg. Uh, there's this peptide called GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1. And when you eat a meal, it's released from cells in your gut into the blood. And it does, it does two things that improve glucose regulation. One is that it it enhances the ability of cells to remove glucose from the blood. And the other is it can actually increase insulin production acutely. But then Nigel and I did studies first with cultured neurons and then in animal models where we found that uh, a, a GLP-1 analog that they developed uh, was neuroprotective. And including in the MPTP model of Parkinson's. And then um, uh, a neurologist, um, Foltini in, 
in England did a couple of clinical trials of this. It's called Xenon, Xenon 4, Xenotide in Parkinson's patients, and that looks promising. Um, and another potential approach is um, boosting ketone levels. Uh, nerve cells can use either glucose or ketones as an energy source. And there's quite a bit of evidence that the ketones also have signaling functions that, for example, suppress epileptic seizures and maybe reduce vulnerability to excitotoxicity. Um, so in my own view, these are some emerging approaches that are promising. There's, for example, these ketone esters where you can just essentially drink these ketones and they elevate your ketone levels. So I think that's a kind of a, you'd say in a way, less specific approach rather than developing a drug that blocks a specific pathway. But what do you think about this boosting energy metabolism as an approach? Oh, I, 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 I think it's worth pursuing. I, I should mention, you know, we've, um, we, we, collaborated with a radiologist here, a chemist in the Department of Radiology, Suki Lee, who had developed a brain penetrant, long-acting GLP-1 receptor agonist. Oh. And um, we, we, we showed that it was very protective in the synuclein transgenic model and a Pathologic alpha and, and two two pathologic alpha synuclein models. And oh, I missed, and I somehow I missed that. You published that, right? Yeah, yeah. It was in Nature Medicine. I I, I can send you a copy of the paper. Uh, I'll find it right after I talk to you. I'm gonna go look it up because somehow I missed that. Boy, that's and, and, that's and great. it's um, it's it's now in phase two clinical trial. You know there and and Mark there there are. I think at least half a dozen clinical trials with different GLP-1 receptor agonists yeah. in Parkinson's disease. I, I, I think it's really potentially an exciting um, treatment for PD. And yeah, then I, you're- I was, I was kind of fortunate to be just by chance, you know, at NIA and with, Josephine and Nigel when they were developing this and helped them out. So that's kind of gratifying to have a little bit of a role in that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, um, it's, it's, it's um, really quite um, interesting. I, 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 you know, in, in the full disclosure, I mean, that this is part of our company. And, uh -huh. and, 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 and so I, I, I'm, I'm really, um, you know, bias toward thinking that they're 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 going to work. Sure. Um, the on on your other thing with ketones, you know, as, as you know, you know, intermittent fasting can also raise ketones, and um, and 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 if you know, taking these ketones and drinking them is also beneficial. You know, I. I, I would be in favor that we need to do a clinical trial. Yeah. Um, and they're you know, safe. I mean, they're perfectly safe as, as one, you know, good aspect of these approaches. There's really no major side effect. Now, I did a podcast with Steve Cunane. I don't know if you know him, yeah. but he's he did PET imaging with radio labeled acetoacetate, one of the ketones that are produced in our body during fasting and with extended exercise. And then he, in the same people, he did uh, radio labeled 2-deoxyglucose. So essentially he's, he's looking at the utilization of either glucose or ketones by brain cells in living patients. And then he did it before, and I think it was like a week or two after they went on a ketogenic diet. And the bottom line is on the ketogenic diet, the brain cells switch. It's like 
very dramatic. In a ketogenic state, the nerve cells are using ketones. Now, we know in Alzheimer's, neurons have a problem using glucose. But Steve Kunane has evidence that, at least in the early stages of Alzheimer's, the neurons can still use ketones well. You know, so I don't know, and this hasn't been looked at so much in Parkinson's, or has it? 2 deoxyglucose has that been done in Parkinson's to see whether there's problems uh, in using glucose? I, I'm, I imagine someone's looked at it, but, 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 but yeah. I'm, I'm just not familiar with that literature. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see what, oh yeah, finally, two other things, uh, brain stimulation. That is a, that is a treatment that has been used in some Parkinson's patients. Could you briefly describe what that involves? Yeah, this um, actually um, stemmed from work that was done here at Johns Hopkins by Malin DeLong in the MPTP model, in, in the MPTP non-human primate model. They showed that um, lesioning the subthalamic nucleus in non-human primates dramatically alleviated the symptoms of Parkinson's disease in um, the um, monkeys who were made Parkinsonian with MPTP. And then that led to um, doing what, what were called pallidotomies in patients where they'd actually lesion the pallidum. And then um, eventually um, scientists started um, putting electrodes in the subthalamic nucleus to try to mimic what had been shown with that, you know, le lesioning the subthalamic nucleus and monkeys. And what they found was that it was dramatically um, would alleviate the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And it's really become a major treatment arm in the management of um, Parkinson's disease. Um, you know, I, one, one, one way to look at it is it sets the clock back by about two to three years. Um, some, some patients just have dramatic responses where, whereas others just have mild, mild, mild effect, but, 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 but it's definitely part of a, the, the treatment regimen for patients with Parkinson's disease. That's a, but it's an invasive procedure, right? You have to put electrode in the brain. So. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you got to image the patient with MRI, then you got to drill a hole in their brain, you got to put the electrode in, you need to record, make sure you're in the right place. And then, you know, then once you're in the right place, you leave the electrode there. Yeah. And then you tunnel down to the chest yeah. where there's a battery, which you can program to stimulate the um, subthalamic nucleus. And, and it takes a while to adjust the stimulators. Each, each individual patient, the, the stimulation needs to be customized. Wow. Okay, finally. So you're, you're director of the, uh, the essentially Stem Cell Institute, uh, Cell Engineering Institute there at Hopkins. And for a long time, there was some work looking at whether you could, for example, inject stem cells into the brain and and recover function in Parkinson's. Is there are there still any efforts to use cell engineering as a potential approach? Yeah, you know there. Um, so 
maybe over a decade ago, maybe longer, there were, you know, two or three um, placebo controlled fetal dopamine neuron transplant trials. There were, with, within those trials, there were subgroups of patients that had dramatic benefit, but there were also patients who had dramatic um, complications in that they would develop runaway dyskinesias. And so if you take the whole study group as a whole, you know, there was, there was no benefit. But with the advent of being able to make dopamine neurons from inducible pluripotent stem cells, embryonic stem cells in culture, there's a new attempt to try to see whether these um, dopamine neurons derived from these cultures could be used to benefit um, Parkinson's disease. And, and, and those studies are ongoing as we speak. And we just have to see whether they're um, beneficial or not. Yeah. I, we, um, I had one postdoc who spent a lot of time trying to, there was this, I think it was at that point, this one publication suggesting that you using these kind of the same approach as you use to make, to convert these pluripotent stem cells to a particular type to, the idea was to convert astrocytes, the glial cells in the brain directly into neurons. And so the idea would be like you'd introduce a few genes into the astrocytes uh, and there's ways to do that. And then they could just produce new neurons. but. We, he he failed. We we were never able to to do it, and he spent a lot of time on it. And I think that hasn't proven to be very easy to do. No, there were there were a couple of papers that were published a couple of years ago that said you could do it, and then there were some follow up papers that said it was an artifact of the way they did the study. Yeah, we couldn't, and 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 so. Yes, um, it, it's a neat idea, but it, but, but, but it hasn't been proven yet that it could, it, it could actually work. Okay. Lastly, what's your most, ex I guess not necessarily you, the most exciting projects from the uh, Cell Engineering Institute? <laughs> oh, oh, probably, you know, it's, it, it's not stem cell stuff. Mark, but you know, we're um, I I I view the Cell Engineering Institute as more of an engineering institute on cells, okay. and, and probably the, the the most exciting stuff would be um, Greg Semenza's work on HIF one alpha, you know, which which led to him winning the Nobel Prize <laughs> um, for. Um, you know how 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 the cell senses oxygen. I mean, there there there's obviously many important things going on here, but yeah. it's 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 hard to beat a Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Ted, we've we've spent an hour and a half. Uh, it's gone by really quickly, at least for me. And Same I, here. you know, I I think you've given the listeners a lot of information. Um, and, you know, hopefully not only have they learned something, but maybe they have some new ideas on how to reduce their risk for uh, Parkinson's. And um, yeah, so Ted, as always, great to talk to you. Say hi to Valina. Yeah, yeah, Mark, it, it, it was great seeing you and, um, and um, I, Greatly enjoyed this, and um, till we um, see one another again, have a great day. Okay, Ted, bye. Bye.